All right. <clears throat> so uh, my name is Dr. Jennifer Betts, and I'm a veterinary medical director for the Dogs of Chernobyl program underneath the Clean Futures Fund. And I'm going to give you a presentation today about our program and how the Russian occupation of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant affected the dogs of Chernobyl. Uh, first, I would like to point out, you'll see here the ER uh, in the spelling and then the OR. The ER is actually the Russian English translation and the OR is actually the Ukrainian English translation. So you'll see this used interchangeably throughout the presentation uh, just out of respect for Ukraine and Ukrainians. Uh, normally, everybody in English knows that this is how we spell it and, and, and become known for that, but I um, wanted to, to respect the OR, the Chernobyl. Uh, a little history about myself. I'm a veterinarian and owned a veterinary practice for over 20 years in Portland, Oregon. I'm currently retired and dedicate most of my life to running nonprofit organizations. I have two that I manage, one being the Clean Futures Fund Dogs of Chernobyl program and the other is Visiting Veterinarians International. This is a free webinar, but I do ask you that if you enjoy the webinar, if you could show us by you know, giving a small donation either directly to our website or by purchasing some of our merchandise that we have on the website that's available. Um, we are a 100% volunteer organization, so all donations go directly to support our cause and uh, nothing goes into anybody's paycheck. And then I'd like for you to, if you could jot down any questions that you may have uh, and hold it till the end, uh, and then we'll have a question and answer session at the end. So first I wanna start off by showing you a short video about our program. Uh, I'm not going to go into depth about the history of Chernobyl and how we got started because most of the presentation is about the dogs of Chernobyl after the start of the war. And I think that this video does an excellent job in a shorter amount of time at explaining this. Uh, this video was created about five years ago at the beginning of our program as a fundraising purposes. So I'm just going to play the first couple of minutes of it so that you can get a quick understanding of our program. And then we can continue on with, with the rest of the presentation. Uh, for those of you who uh, may not know, Chernobyl is the site of the world's worst industrial accident in history. And today is the 37th anniversary of that accident. I remember the first time I stepped onto the Semikoti train on my way to the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The train ride from the worker town of Slavutich to the power plant takes just over 40 minutes as it winds its way through Belarus, back into Ukraine, and ultimately ends at Chernobyl. As soon as we were cleared by security to enter the plant site, we began walking through the gold-colored metal walls of the train station to the nearest exit for our first view of the sarcophagus and new confinement structure. As we passed through the security station, I can recall opening the door and stepping outside for the first time. As my eyes adjusted to the light, I turned to look at the sarcophagus constructed over the Unit 4 reactor in 1986 and the new confinement structure that was currently under construction. I turned around to say something to one of my colleagues when I noticed my first Chernobyl dog. I paused mid-sentence and began looking around me and quickly counted five to ten stray dogs meandering around the open spaces of the facility. This was not at all what I had expected. I think that most people think of Chernobyl as a post-apocalyptic wasteland and would be surprised to know that over 2,000 men and women work at the plant site every day or that there are over 200 stray dogs roaming the grounds of the nuclear power plant, even the security areas. Over the years, I have observed and began planning for their ultimate care and well-being. Today, it is all culminating with our Dogs of Chernobyl program. One of the first questions that people always ask is, where did all of these dogs come from? After the Unit 4 reactor building exploded in April 1986, and radioactive materials were released into the environment, the Soviet government was forced to evacuate over 120,000 residents that lived in nearly 200 cities and villages in the 30 kilometers surrounding the nuclear power plant. The evacuees weren't warned that they would never be allowed to return to their homes, and were also told to leave their pets and animals behind. 
The Soviet military later sent soldiers into the exclusion zone to cull the abandoned animals, but some of them survived. This is one of the earliest photographs we have of the dogs of Chernobyl. It proves that within a few short weeks, dogs and puppies had already migrated out of the wilderness to the populated areas at the plant where workers were trying to construct the sarcophagus to stem the spread of contamination into the environment. The stray dogs that live at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant and surrounding exclusion zone today are largely descendants of these abandoned pets. They are being driven out of the wilderness by predators and a lack of food and water. The workers at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant have adopted these animals. They feed them, and if they notice that an animal is injured, they will try to bring it inside or give it what medical attention they can. While this interaction is good for the animals and for the workers, it also carries considerable risk. The animals have been exposed to rabies by other wild animals in the exclusion zone, including the packs of wolves that have claimed the surrounding areas. Ukraine receives its rabies vaccine for humans from Russia, but it has not been receiving adequate supply for nearly five years because of the breakdown of relations and the escalating conflict with Russia in eastern Ukraine. With the collaboration and support of the Chernobyl Nuclear Power Plant, the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone Management Agency, and organizations and universities around the world, we have developed a three-year program to spay, neuter, and vaccinate the stray dogs of Chernobyl. We need your help to get anything done. Please consider... Okay, so that was a brief history of, of our program, how we get started. This is the area that I will be talking about for the rest of the presentation. This is the new safe confinement structure that was built over, over top of the old sarcophagus um, that covers the reactor number four. <coughs> Excuse me. The sarcophagus that they constructed over reactor four was an emergency temporary fix <clears throat> to stem the spread of the radiation and was to only last about 30 years. So then they constructed the new safe confinement structure uh, to cover the old sarcophagus and this lasts around 100 years. So maybe in 100 more years, they'll have to replace it. But during the construction of the new safe confinement, there were a lot of dogs living around and underneath it while they were building it and have remained in this area as well as other areas around the zone. <clears throat> so today I'll be talking about this certain pack of dogs that live in this area at the local zone or the arch. So living all around in this area. <clears throat> so as you heard on the video, the Dogs of Chernobyl program set up spay and neuter clinics in Chernobyl exclusion zone to help control the population of dogs that were getting out of control. Between 2017 and 2019, we successfully spayed, neutered, and vaccinated over 750 dogs that reside in the zone. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we were unable to perform any clinics in 2020 and 2021. So in early 2022, the nuclear power plant contacted us and said, you've got to do something about the dogs living at the arch. They are reproducing at a rapid rate and there's hundreds of them all around here and something needs to be done very soon. So we said, okay, we think COVID has settled down enough for us to travel. Uh, so we decided to start making plans to perform another spay neuter clinic specifically at the new safe confinement where a lot of these dogs in the past were difficult to catch. We started making plans for having our project in May of 2022, but then the unthinkable happened. February 24, 2022, I woke up early with numerous text messages and calls on my phone. Russian forces had invaded Ukraine and captured Chernobyl nuclear power plant. We had no contact with anyone for over a month. <clears throat> we had contact with people in the worker town of Saludich, but nobody at the power plant as they had taken 150 hostages and held them captive in a bunker at the power plant for 30 days. So since many of the dogs rely on the workers at the power plant to feed them, they had, were not fed for 30 days. I was told that a couple of workers were able to sneak out and feed them some scraps, but essentially they were not fed at all for 30 days. Some of the dogs ran off either in search of food or because of the loud commotion that was going on with the tanks and such. But unfortunately, a lot of them stayed around just waiting and waiting to be fed. <clears throat> so this video here 
This video is a uh, video that was found on the CCT television. Uh, it wasn't confiscated and it was found after the liberation of the power plant. And this is the Lelive checkpoint, in, which is between Chernobyl town and uh, Chernobyl nuclear power plant. So these tanks here, this is what they found. Just this went on for hours and hours. This video is about 20 minutes long, but I just took a couple clips to show you some important things. So this is actually, if you see the timestamp as well, they had already captured Chernobyl and now they're making their way to Kyiv to try to overtake Kyiv. And this is what you saw on the news media where there was a, a convoy of uh, tanks that just sat in one area for hours and hours and days and days uh, trying to, to enter Kyiv, which was unsuccessful. But uh, one of the things, a couple things I wanted to show you about this, this video here uh, coming up right here, if you look, right here. So if you see this, you know, I'm, I'm not a military person. So these missiles or bombs or whatever these are, you know, this is, this is pretty significant. They're bringing this into Ukraine. Uh, so they, you know, they, they, this wasn't a training exercise. They were meant to do some serious damage. Uh, and so you can see, you know, there's no reason for them to, to be bringing this in if it, it was a training exercise, like they tried to, to make everybody believe. Even the soldiers had said that's what they were there for. So one of the other things I wanted to show you uh, on this video that's coming up here in just a second. <clears throat> if you notice in the back here, this little white structure that's coming out of the woods, she's running alongside the, the tank there. This is actually a dog and you'll see her running across the street there. So she actually lives at the uh, Lelov checkpoint. She lives with the guards at the guardhouse and she's lived there for several years. And I happened to see this when I was looking through the video and, and then I realized that this is actually the last time that we ever saw her. Um, we have never been able to find her since then. I, I don't know what happened to her, but she is no longer around, which is pretty unfortunate. So on April 1st, 2022, Russian forces retreated and the Ukrainians gained control over the power plant again. So we were finally able to make contact with people in Chernobyl and this was a great relief. We still didn't have contact with some of our friends and loved ones in the town of Ivankiv, but we were able to get some information from the power plant. And of course, my first questions were, what about the dogs? How are they? So these are the first photos that I received of the dogs. They were able to do some snapshots and send them to me. And as you can see, they were pretty much just skin and bones. They were basically starving. And as you can see here, <clears throat> just basic skin and bones. They haven't eaten for 30 days. So after seeing the conditions of the dogs, I thought we have to get some food to them somehow. And as it just so happened, Andrew Simon, who works for my partner, Dr. Mousseau at the Chernobyl Research Initiative, was going to try to go to Chernobyl and check on the laboratory that we had there. We had a lot of equipment at the lab and we were told that the door was kicked in and a lot of the stuff was stolen. So when Andrew told me that he was going to try to get to the lab and check on things, I was like, can you please, please take some dog food? <clears throat> so at this point, Andrew was one of the very few people to be able to enter the zone. And since Andrew was going to be able to make the long tri trip, I brainstormed with a friend of mine in Europe named Charlie Tango and found out where I could purchase some dog food and I had uh, Andrew pick it up in Kiev. Andrew told me that he had a trailer and he could load it up. So I went ahead and I purchased 300 kilograms, which is 660 pounds of dog food to start. And these are some of the first bags of food. So this is a picture of Andrew's vehicle and, uh, and Andrew standing back here. And as you can see, the trailer's loaded with food and so is the back of his vehicle. It took him nine hours to reach Chernobyl. Normally it takes one and a half hours because of the blown up bridges and the ruined roads and because of the tanks, it took him nine hours to get there, to get to Chernobyl. He was not allowed to drive all the way into the power plant he could only drop off the food at the guard houses at the Dikiaki checkpoint, but he was able to actually get into Chernobyl town and go in and check on the laboratory. And it was in fact broken into and, and some of the stuff was stolen. 
So at this point, they were busing in the new workers to relieve the other workers that had been there. And uh, I got on this Viber chat group that I had that I belonged to with some of the other uh, some of the dog lovers that help care for the dogs of Chernobyl, the workers that work there. And I got on the chat group and I begged them to tell all their friends to please, please grab a bag of dog food that was waiting at the guardhouse and take it with them on the bus to the power plant. So even people that didn't even like dogs grabbed a bag of dog food. It was really amazing. Everybody knew the conditions that the dogs were in and they wanted to help regardless of whether they liked dogs or not. So every time they passed by, they would all get out of the bus and they'd grab a bag of dog food and they'd carry it with them to the power plant. And this is a picture of the dogs getting their first significant amount of food since the invasion after 30 days. And you can see the bag of food and uh, they were basically in a feeding frenzy. We continued to bring food in as much as we could, working with the buses that took the workers to the power plant. Also at this time, Andrew was able to get around Chernobyl town to be able to feed some of the dogs that lived in Chernobyl town. And after discussing with him, he decided that he could easily make some automatic dog feeders uh, to put around the zone so that the dogs in Chernobyl town could be fed. And I was like, great, let's do it. And so these are some of the feeders here that he placed all around, around Chernobyl town. It worked really, really well. So Andrew you know, asked me, he said, I can make a bunch more. And I was like, perfect, let's do it. Let's go for it. And here's more. <laughs> he made a lot more. <clears throat> so since that day, he has been delivering 800 kilograms which is 1,760 pounds of food per week to the dogs in the zone. So after everything that happened, all I can think about was the condition of the dogs and our friends. I needed to get there to check on the dogs and see what their health status was. So Eric, the founder of Clean Futures Fund and I decided that we were gonna make the long trip to Chernobyl despite many objections from our family members. And in June of 2022, we decided to make the trip. You can't fly into Ukraine, so you have to fly into Poland and take an 18 hour train ride from Poland into Kyiv. And this is us lack of sleep on the train and this ar arriving in its train station in, uh, in Kyiv. When we arrived at the train station, we met up with Andrew and Vadim. So this is Andrew and this is Vadim here. Vadim has been with a volunteer with CFF uh, since the very, very beginning. And he, he had made these flags for us. He'd made a bunch of these flags and he'd take these flags everywhere we went and he'd put them on everything and took pictures of, of the flag everywhere. He was, he was very proud of the, the flags that he, that he made. So Vadim, Eric, Andrew and I, we made the long journey to Chernobyl. And this is pretty much what we saw the whole way, uh, blown up bridges, a lot of destruction, more blown up bridges. This is a pontoon bridge that they set up so that we could cross through here. So you can imagine this wasn't even here then, so you can imagine why it took Andrew nine hours to, to get to Chernobyl. And of course, on the way, we had to stop and feed Simon the fox and give her some flea medication. <clears throat> it was pretty funny. I, I gave her some Brovecto uh, flea and tick medication and those people that are in the veterinary industry, they, they know about this product. It's a flea and tick medication. I gave it to her for treatment and she spit it out right away. She started frothing at the mouth and shaking her head and was like, no way, I'm not eating that. And then I decided to try some NexGuard flea and tick treatment. And she absolutely loved it. <laughs> so she wanted more and kept trying to get more, but I could only give her one dose. So I, I thought maybe she could possibly be the spokes fox for NexGuard flea and tick medication. <laughs> So we went around to all of the offices in Chernobyl to deliver aid. All of the offices were broken into. They stole everything. Uh, from, they stole the hard drive and the RAM from every single computer throughout every single office throughout Chernobyl town. Um, and it, it is believed the reason they did this was so that uh, Russia could prove that Ukraine was making radiological weapons or dirty bombs which we know was not true. This was just plain office buildings with office computer stuff that they went in and they, they trashed everything. Nothing was viable. 
Um, we actually ended up, you know, sending a bunch of uh, computers and stuff to them afterwards to try to get them back on their feet. But one of our biggest fears were landmines. They were everywhere. But by the time that we got there, the majority of the places, at least the major roads, had been cleared and deemed safe. So these images here um, are images of the trenches that were dug in the Red Forest by the Russian military. And I'm sure that you heard on the news about the Russian soldiers that dug trenches in the Red Forest. Well, the Red Forest is called the Red Forest because when the accident happened, all of the trees turned red and all their leaves fell off and, and they all died. And since then, this area is convinced been called the Red Forest and is considered one of the most radioactive places in the world. So the Russian soldiers were staying in these trenches. They were sleeping there. They were cooking their meals there. They were building campfires. They were in stirring up all of the ground and inhaling all of these particles, which is extremely dangerous. They were not... Uh, they didn't stay in there long enough to receive large amounts of radiation to cause acute radiation sickness, but they definitely did receive enough radiation uh, that it will most likely cause some problems later in life. I know you heard on the news that a lot of the soldiers were having acute radiation sickness, and that really wasn't the case. Uh, when they finally found out where they were, because they didn't know anything about the Red Forest, uh, and, and they didn't realize where they were, you know, a lot of them psychosomatically were sick. But in all reality, there, there wasn't anybody that had acute radiation sickness. But unfortunately, um, if they do live long enough, they probably will end up with some type of uh, cancers or problems later in life. So this is a fire truck at the Chernobyl fire station. And unfortunately, it, it had a run over a landmine. Thank goodness there was nobody killed during this uh, situation. A firefighter was injured. But um, this goes to show you the, the sear destruction that can happen just from rolling over a landmine that you don't know is there. This is what we saw everywhere. This is the town of um, Ivankiv, which is right before you enter into Chernobyl. And all of the cars, you know, burned down cars, cars rolled over by tanks. It was just, just pure destruction buildings blown up left and right. Uh, this is actually in the town of Chernihiv, which is right outside of Slavudich, the worker town. So we, we make it to the highly secure area of the power plant just at the base of the arch or the new safe confinement. There are a lot of dogs and new puppies everywhere. In the past, we had been unsuccessful in 2017, 18 and 19 in catching the dogs that live in this area. And the reason why is because this is an industrial area and there are a lot of fences and obstacles for the dogs to, to run through and, and, and get out. So in the past, because it's a highly secure area, we would only have one day where we, we'd be allowed to go in this restricted area. And when we would go in there and we would blow dart one dog, all the other dogs would take off running. They'd run through the fences and they'd go underneath them and go into areas that we couldn't, couldn't get to. So over the years, we were only able to get maybe two or three dogs from this area each time that we went. So since we were unable to get many dogs in this area, the breeding got out of control and became unmanageable. And this is the reason that we're here. <clears throat> since we had been sending food in and feeding them and fattening them up, they were healthy enough to do what they do best, uh, which is breed and have puppies. Um, so I, I saw probably 10 or 11 pregnant dogs just in this area alone when we were there in June. And this is a picture of me uh, feeling her pregnant belly. Since we knew that blow darting was not going to work here, since it did not work in the past, we started looking for areas that we could section off and make corrals to contain the dogs. <clears throat> and these are some of the places that we found, just some old areas that we can put up fencing and use it as makeshift corrals. So after seeing all of these pregnant dogs around and all the puppies at the arch, Eric and I decided that we needed to get back here soon. So we started making plans right then and there to return in just a couple months later in, in early October. 
we knew that we needed to train the dogs to get them to enter into the makeshift corrals, uh, but we weren't going to be around to, to do that. And so I had noticed on the Viber chat group that I was constantly on that there was this uh, one gentleman named Yuri who was very knowledgeable of the dogs and had a great concern for them. So I, <clears throat> I struck up a conversation with him. And now he only speaks Ukrainian and I do not. Uh, so keep in mind the time difference, the translations that needed to take place, the copying and pasting into Google Translate back and forth. I found myself conversing with him about three o'clock in the morning, every single morning. Um, I wasn't at that time, wasn't really getting much sleep anyway, so it didn't really matter. Um, I spoke to him about ways to train the dog and dogs to get him to go into the corral. And, and he was very receptive to my ideas and, and he got to training the dogs right away. <clears throat> he would send me messages at three in the mornings saying, I got them to go in the fenced area. I got them to go in the fenced area. And he would send me pictures. So I was like, great, that's awesome. Now let's practice closing the gate. So here's some pictures here of them in the areas and some more corrals where he got them to go inside. <clears throat> so then he would send me more pictures. I got the gate closed. I got the gate closed. <laughs> it, was, it was really great working with him. And I developed a friendship with a guy over Viber chat who I had no idea what he even looked like. And, you know, I knew that he was vital to the success of us catching the dogs. And I knew that we needed his help because he knew every single one of these dogs. He even had names for every single one of them. Uh, he also helped deliver many of the puppies that were born over the years. So these were basically his dogs and, and he loved them. So I asked him if he could, if it was possible, if he could make his schedule so that it coincided with when we were going to be there in October. And, uh, and he, he was absolutely thrilled. He, he wanted to help us. And so he was able to make his schedule change and everything was set up <clears throat> and he was going to uh, come with us and help us catch the dogs. But then two weeks before the campaign, two major things happened. Yuri tells me he was laid off at the plant they were doing massive layoffs and after 32 years of work, he no longer had access to the power plant. We had to do an emergency request to get permissions for him to enter the zone with us as a CFF volunteer. And the other situation, Vadim had informed me that he will not be able to help us in October as he had signed up for the Ukrainian military. His brother had been drafted and he wanted to join alongside him to keep him safe. Um, of course, they did not put both of them together in the same unit uh, and they sent Vadim off to the front lines to fight. And as you can see, he was still very proud <clears throat> to be a CFF member that he'd send us pictures of him down in these bunkers and he put <laughs> CFF stickers all over his guns and other things that he would send us. It was pretty funny. Um, so Vadim, he had done a lot of preparation and org organizing for our upcoming trip. And it was a shame that he was not going to be able to work with us again this year, like he had done every single year since we first started. <clears throat> so October, 2022 rolls around and we rounded up a small group of veterinarians, veterinary technicians and dog handlers that volunteered with us in the past and were also somewhat comfortable with going into a war-torn country. Uh, we, we all got together and we hit the long 18-hour train ride from Poland into Kyiv. Here's the train. Of course, we're relaxing before we go. We meet up with a group of uh, volunteers from Germany, Ukraine, United Kingdom, and we meet in Kyiv and then all pack up the van and head off to Chernobyl. And here's our van with, loaded with supplies. <clears throat> this is a photo, group photo of, of everybody that was working on this project this year in, in October in 2022. Uh, there were 18 of us that, that went, um, you know, half of us speak English, half of us don't. So that was uh, a unique experience as well. well. I finally get to meet Yuri. He gave me a big hug when we met, um, even though neither one of us had any idea what the other one was saying. We both knew that we had a mission 
and we had a unique bond uh, through the love of the dogs. So uh, this is a video that I wanted to show you. When we had first got to the, the uh, new safe confinement, to the, the secure area, we had just went through the checkpoint. We had gone through the metal detectors and through the, the security. And I knew going outside that door that there were a lot of dogs on the other side. And, and, and Yuri had barreled past me uh, and uh, to run outside. And, and so I knew what he was doing. So I grabbed my phone and I wanted to take a video because I wanted to see the reaction of him for the first time seeing his dogs. Uh, it had been over 30 days since he'd seen them and, and he was probably never going to be able to see them again. So I grabbed my camera and, and this is the uh, the video that that took that I took. So they, they would run from us, but they didn't run from him. Um, we nicknamed him Papa after this. And um, he actually had a little bit of a tear in his eye when, when he was there to, to see his dogs. So this is the area that right here is one of the corrals that we had made. So the dogs that live right in this area, which is we come outside this door here and then enter in this area here. A lot of them lived in this area. So this is one pack of dogs and there's a lot more, but there's that you see in this picture here. And then we're a little further away. Here's the new safe confinement back here. So we're a little further down and this is another second pack of dogs. And these dogs stay, stay away from each other and they stay pretty much in packs. So this is in the corral up front. And the great thing about this is that uh, we just stood back and Yuri got some food and he lured all of them in. <laughs> about 40 dogs at once lured them into this corral and closed the gate. And then we would be able to go in there and, and he could pick them up or I could pick them up or the ones that, that I couldn't get pick up, I could get close enough to and give them a little bit of a, a sedative injection. But these dogs here, uh, these, these four, they were extremely fearful and uh, we couldn't get anywhere near them. Uh, Yuri couldn't even get anywhere near them. So what we did was we put sedatives inside of doggy meatballs and just fed it to them and waited and waited quite a while, but waited for them to just kind of go to sleep enough for us to be able to touch them. So we didn't have to blow dart anybody. And this was definitely a fear-free uh, mission that, that we, we accomplished. Once the dogs are caught, we brought them back to our makeshift hospital that we set up. And the very first thing that we can do before anything else is we need to frisk the dogs for radiation. We need to make sure that they are clean of any radioactive contaminants before going into surgery. And if we do find that any of them have significant radioactive contaminants on them, we take them outside and we give them a bath. And then if that doesn't work, we clip the fur that has <clears throat> particles on it. Okay. So this is a video here of a pup that we were not able to wash the particles off. We recently brought two little siblings into the clinic. After we frisked them for radiation, we found a hot spot on the top of both of their heads, about 14 or 1500 counts per minute. We'd like it to be under 200. So we gave them a bath. Um, we gave the brother a bath. And despite that, both of them still have contamination right on the top of their head. So we determined that it's probably non-removable. It's maybe fixed contamination inside the bone structure, likely strontium-90 that's, that's treated like calcium by the body. So if you can see, top of this poor girl's head is over 1,000 counts per minute. Okay, that's 1,200. And I'm gonna demonstrate that this is non-removable. I'm gonna really put my fingers 
So if there was something on the top of, of her head, it's going to be on my glove right now, okay? So let's check my glove. So. Yeah, you do your glove again. So this is uh, this is the sister of the little dog that we just saw in that video, and um, as you can see, you know we still went ahead and spayed her. There is nothing that can come off and be a po pose a risk to us. Uh, unfortunately, it is in her skull, and um, but but she was did fine, and and we uh, proceeded with our our project. And this is a mama dog here who had puppies that were just one uh, one week of age, and so obviously they were too young for us to spay. Uh, Yuri had made this makeshift bed for her in between these uh, cement uh, bags, and then these are some little puppies that they huddled right outside the door. This is the door that we would go into where our clinic we set up, and we had nicknamed them the uh, the door puppies. And so when we had a lull time in between dogs, um, we were mostly focusing on getting all of the females that were able to have puppies and, and breed. And so obviously they're not young enough, or they're not old enough yet to do that. So whenever we would have a time in between trying to catch dogs, then I would go outside and grab a puppy and bring it in so that we were never had any kind of downtime at all. We were constantly going and making use of our time that we were there. Yeah, this is a picture of one of our volunteers, Pam, carrying one of the dogs through uh, through the hospital here into surgery. One of the highlights uh, of this trip was that every single evening we would go outside and, and we would feed the dogs. And it was like the Pied Piper <laughs> or something. Uh, Yuri would take his food dish and there would be zero dogs there and he would just rattle his food dish and they would come running from everywhere, from underneath the fences, from the woods, from underneath bushes. They would just appear out of nowhere, hundreds of dogs ready to get fed. So this is the same mama dog that I talked about. And, you know, puppies were too small uh, and they were nursing. And the one thing that's really great about this is that uh, one of the Ukrainian veterinarians that we worked with uh, is is really skilled in doing flank incisions. And what this is, this is a, an incision in her in her flank. And uh, this is not something that is taught in the United States to veterinarians. It is something I'd love to learn how to do. But the reason for this is that we can go ahead and spay her, and she can allow the puppies to nurse. And this way, they won't nurse on her incision. They won't chew out any stitches or cause any pain to her. So. It came in pretty handy. We, we had to do this to a couple dogs. These puppies here were, um, they're pretty small, but we were able to go ahead and, and spay and neuter them. Um, ideally, you don't really want to spay them that young, but uh, we, it was either now or never. Um, if we didn't, we didn't know when we were going to be able to come back. And by the time that happened, they would probably be pregnant. So we went ahead and did them and they all did fine. You'll notice the uh, red mark, uh, pink mark on her nose. Uh, in the past, we would put ear tags in their ears and sometimes the ear tags would become troublesome and get infected and, and we would have to remove them or, or, or start bothering the dogs. And I knew that in this area, if one of the tags were to get infected or hurting the dog, we would not be able to catch the dogs again to remove it. So I didn't want to put a tag in there that they would have to run around with a, with a sore ear for the rest of their life. So I decided that I was going to get some uh, temporary hair dye and we placed it on their noses so that we would know that that dog is, was just recently spayed or neutered. And so we wouldn't waste time catching the same dog again. And here's a, another picture of some, some of their noses. Uh, pink and blue. <clears throat> it doesn't really correlate to male or female, but it just so happens that you know she's a female and, and she's it, and this one's a male. <clears throat> so this gorgeous dog lives outside, out front of the administrative building, outside of the local zone. Uh, we were catching the dogs in the local zone, but one morning we had stopped off at the building to drop something off, and I saw the dog there, and, and I said to Darren, one of our, our volunteers, I said, grab that dog. And he says, I don't, I don't have a leash. I don't have a crate. I don't have anything. I was like, ah, it'll be fine. Just pick him up. 
I didn't know if it would be fine or not, but <laughs> but apparently it was. So here he is, um, the dog's first ride in a in a in an automobile, and and Darren couldn't get out because we the dog would have ran off and we would have lost him. So uh, he just sat in the vehicle. And I mean, I wanted to say this is our van um, that was recently purchased. SPCA International and the University of South Carolina Chernobyl Research Initiative gave us funds so that so, so that we could purchase this van. We had lost our previous van, had been destroyed, and um, they were able to provide us the funding so that we could purchase this van so that we can make this mission happen. Uh, SPCA International has been a huge supporter of us since the very beginning. This is inside uh, one of the old buildings that the power plant let us use as one of their training buildings. And they put some stuff down on the floor so they wouldn't ruin the floor. And we were able to set up our, our clinic in several of the rooms here. <clears throat> These are some more cute puppies. This was a, a mama, mama, mama dog and her puppies. And she actually was one of the dogs that I was concerned about that I would see in the previous videos that were sent to me early on, she was skin and bones. I was really worried about her. I knew it was her because she has some funny back legs. Um, but obviously she fattened up and she did just fine because she was able to have a bunch of puppies. Um, and then here's another just cute puppy with a pink spot on his nose. And you can see all the dogs in the background just wondering what's going on. Here's Yuri again with his puppies. Um, this is a photo here, and you see this puppy hasn't been done, but this one has. Um, so we would just grab them and bring them back, and, and whenever we had time, we would grab another puppy and, and, and spay and neuter it while we had time. So this is my partner, Dr. Mousseau, and he's been doing research studying the dog's DNA for genetic mutations, and also recently determined that the dogs that live at the arch are, in fact, the true descendants of the dogs that were left behind in 1986. So there have been speculation. You know, are these dogs really the you know descendants of the dogs all these years later? And and he just determined that they they are in fact the dogs that are the descendants of the dogs left behind. So knowing this, this paves the way for much more information that we can gather in the future, and determine how the radiation has affected these dogs. And as it turns out, the dog is a great model for humans. So the information that we gather here can be extrapolated to humans. Um, he's recently, we've recently had two papers that were published on this topic and there's another one that's getting ready to be published any day now. Um, and uh, on one of the papers, his uh, graduate student, Gabby, uh, who was the first author on, the, on one of the papers, she actually got to come with us in 2018 and uh, help on the project. <clears throat> this, uh, this dog right here was extremely difficult to catch. Um, it took us several days to get her. Uh, even though we'd get her in the corral, we couldn't get near her. Um, we finally were able to, to capture her. And um, this is what, uh, we, what we had here. So this is a dog. This is our first year, 2017. We were here at the local zone of the plant and we were able to catch this dog. It's already been sterilized. Um, as you can see right here, we have the tattoo from 2017, and this particular ear tag is from 2017. Um, every year we've caught the dogs. She is sedated. We've caught the dogs every year uh, to revaccinate them, but sometimes we can't catch them. Uh, a lot of times we would remove a couple months later, get the dosimeter that's on here to check how much radiation they get. Um, but we were, haven't seen this dog and or been able to catch it in several years since 2017. So we were able to catch him today. We're going to revaccinate. She's already been sterilized. We're going to remove this dosimeter so that Dr. Mousseau, um, so that Dr. Mousseau can then in his laboratory be able to see how much radiation this dog has had since 2017. Um, so this, uh, this is a kind of a rare find. Most of the tags have been uh, either removed or came out or we've done them for uh, the, the study that we're doing. Um, so she's, you can see she's doing really well. Uh, she looks like she's you know, probably about uh, five or six years old. So she was a puppy when we did her. And this is, uh, this is really good to show that they're doing fine. And we're seeing that they're living a lot longer because of the sterilization program that we're doing. 
and uh, everything else with, the pro with this program. Okay, so because we needed to bring a small crew, we could only bring a small crew with us, I needed to bring people who were versatile in all areas. And so this gave me the opportunity, gave us the opportunity to do some training. And as you can see, Heather, one of our volunteers is placing a catheter in one of the dogs. And Heather normally does dog catching when she's here. And she probably only had placed one or two catheters or two or three catheters in her life on another campaign with me before here. But um, once, uh, once we were finished, she actually became quite efficient at placing catheters. And this is just my favorite photo. Eric took this photo, um, the founder of, our, of Clean Futures Fund. And this is a photo that actually has been circulating all around the internet. <clears throat> Our plant doing our dogs of Chernobyl project. Some of the challenges we face here, unlike any other dogs project in the world, is radiation safety. We had two juvenile puppies that came through the clinic yesterday and we found out that they had internal contamination actually inside their skull structure. Uh, so we checked out this is the area that they that they hang out in and just after a couple minutes we found a hot spot right over here. Again we're just a couple hundred meters from Unit four and the arch where the events of 1986 occurred. So I looked at the hot spot and I did a little digging and it looks like we found a, a particle potentially from unit four. And this is what these puppies are exposed to and potentially could ingest. So right now, our background reading, this is counts per minute. So think of it just as a reference number. This is 300 counts per minute, 300 counts per minute. Take a look at my finger, just a couple specks of, of dirt and potentially a particle from the reactor. And now let's see what we're gonna get on this meter. This is 700,000 counts per minute. So you can see the challenging environment that we have to work in to keep ourselves safe and keep the animals safe while we're doing surgery. Whew, it didn't, uh, didn't shut down again on me. <laughs> Um, and one of the things there, when he showed the initial, the background radiation of us just standing there, being there, was 385 and you really, really want that to be less than 200. Um, so this is an area that you don't wanna stay in for very long. Um, so anyway, this is, uh, these are some dogs that were caught on the other side of the arch uh, around the front main entrance of the building. And we are you know, focusing mostly on the dogs right at the arch, but these dogs were in an area where we were able to get them and actually we were allowed to bring them into the secure area so that we could spay and neuter them. And they are here waiting to be released um, back to the same location that we took them from because they uh, live in packs. And if we were to release them right in this area, then they would, they would fight. <clears throat> so this is dog number 100. Uh, we were very, very thrilled to get to dog number 100. We were told that there were 70 dogs that lived at the, the arch. And I had uh, budgeted for 100. So I was uh, very, very happy when we hit 100. We actually did 125. Somehow I managed to make my budget of 100 squeak by every little drop of anesthesia I had to get 125 dogs. So this is a picture of our surgery room that we set up. To, and this is to show that even though we are in a basically an apocalyptic wasteland, so they say, uh, we can still perform quality surgery and use the best techniques. All dogs are on IV fluids and gas anesthesia and they're innovated. Um, we do have to make some compromises using ironing boards. And we even took uh, empty beer bottles, uh, Coke bottles and two liter bottles to make positioners so that dogs wouldn't flop over. Um, this is our amazing anesthesia machine uh, that is portable that I carry with me everywhere. We can maintain four dogs at one time. And you can see uh, oxygen. 
and here's another photo dog on a on an ironing board and you know IV fluids during the procedure uh, everything that we possibly can uh, pain medications so that these dogs are, are cared for in the best possible way that you would have done in the United States or for your own pet that you're paying for. So these are some dogs going into, they're in prep, getting ready to go into surgery. And during prep, they are intubated. So a trach tube is put in their mouth, an IV catheter is placed in their leg so that they can be placed on, on fluids during the procedure. Uh, they're shaved and they're scrubbed. An ear tattoo is put in their ear and then they're microchipped. Uh, and then this is this is the dog, the flank, uh, one of the flank incisions here that I was talking about earlier. Uh, so like I said, we did a couple of those where they were pregnant and nursing. So everybody got to do puppy snuggles. Uh, we got a little bit of time for, for snuggling. Every time I turn around, somebody had a puppy in their hand. Uh, but as you can see, you know, this one is too young to do. And uh, right now they are at the age now where they are old enough to start breeding with their brothers and sisters. So we are going to have to go back pretty soon to go ahead and get these guys. Otherwise we're gonna have a problem in a very short time all over again. These pups were hidden under this cement structure. And so we had to send our the smallest volunteer that we had to crawl under the, the cement to retrieve these puppies. And then, of course, afterwards, we had to make sure that uh, that Pam was clean and didn't have any radiation on her. Um, otherwise, we're going to have to take her outside and bathe her. <laughs> so this is a dog that hangs around the canteen out in Chernobyl town. Uh, we were staying every night in Chernobyl town and then went into the power plant. And um, we, since we're focusing on the dogs at the at the power plant, um, I, we weren't trying to catch this dog right away. And um, one morning we had stopped and I tried to make friends with her, him to try to see if I can get him. And this is what they would do. They, they come up to you and they're interested, but as soon as you try to touch them, they take off and, and they run away. And you certainly can't put a leash around their neck because they freak out and they get a roll and they get scared because they've never had a leash around their neck or a collar on their neck. So they don't know what it is. So I, I, I gave up because we had plenty of stuff to do at the arch. And the morning that we did um, have some time to go try to go around Chernobyl town and gather some dogs, uh, we, we tried to get him. And when we went there, he was gone. So uh, he is another one that I, we have to go back and do very soon or he's gonna be a, a father again, as I'm sure many of them are probably his, his babies. And every time Yuri has a puppy in his hands, he just has a huge smile on his face. So this is another situation, <laughs> poor Darren, where I, I told him, I said, grab, we stopped at administrative building again out in front of um, the main entrance. And uh, I told him, I said, grab that dog. And he, I think at this time, there was no place for him to sit in the van because we were all packed, packed in. So we had him sit in the back in the trunk area. Um, and this dog here is, is one of my favorite dogs. Uh, I named her, nicknamed her Prancer because every time you come up to the administrative building, she comes running and she just does this little prance and dance uh, the way that she walks. Um, if, if I were to, to take any dog from Chernobyl, if, if I could, I, I would definitely want to bring her home, but unfortunately that's not possible. So these are our final numbers and I couldn't be any more pleased. I was so happy. Uh, if you think about it, <clears throat> you know, the, the female dogs are the ones that have puppies, right? So out of 125 dogs, 75 of them were females. And so if, if every female has at least six puppies, which the dogs here in Chernobyl generally have around six puppies in their litters, that's 450 puppies that we prevented from being born just this year. And so um, that's 450 puppies that, you know, didn't have to go through the cold winters, possibly starve to death, possibly get attacked by other animals. And um, so I was extremely thrilled. And we did 44 dog neuters and six of them were already sterilized. So we went ahead and vaccinated them and dewormed them with a total of 125 dogs that we did. And this was basically in a four day period. So as a special treat to us and as a big thank you from the power plant, 
they gave us all a special tour to an area of the power plant that very, very few people ever get to go. We got to go see reactor number four control room and also got to go right up to the sarcophagus. Uh, and this is a pictures of us getting suited up in the highly radioactive area. We had to double suit up. So we have two layers of clothing on. We had to put on respirators, hard hat, gloves, shoes, just to be able to go into these areas. And this is walking down the golden corridor. This is the long hallway in between the reactors. And uh, the walls are, are a gold color, so it's nicknamed the, the Golden Corridor. This is in, this is the first place that we went. And this is in, in control room number three for reactor number three. And they've kept this control room in really good working order to be able to, to show people what it looked like. Um, since the reactor shut down now, they've kept it pristine. And this is, you know, this is what you saw in the Chernobyl mini series. I don't know if y'all saw that, but um, this is the control room. Another picture. And these are some of the, 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 the buttons that uh, do the reactor to shut down the reactor. So this is all of us waiting to enter the heat restricted area of control room four. So this is the control room for the reactor that exploded and is highlighted in the HBO miniseries. And this is where you have to wear the respirator and gloves and everything to enter. And so it's, uh, you know, it's old and, and dilapidated and run down. But you can see control room three, what it looked like, and then control room four. Um, this is very close to the reactor that exploded. And some more photos of the control room. <clears throat> okay, and the other area we got to go, this is the sarcophagus that was built over the destroyed reactor number four. So this is it right here, the sarcophagus. And this is the new safe confinement. So this is the dome that you saw on the outside. So this is us, we're actually under inside the dome right next to the, the sarcophagus. Um, so this is the thing that they had to construct that's gonna last a hundred years to, to protect this area. And then just another photo that you could get a little better view of it. And of course, we had to take a group photo in front of the sarcophagus. It was not many people get to do that. And then more group photos. This is outside the new safe confinement. This is the building right there. We're on the outside of it now. And as we were taking the photos, um, I happened to look over the, the um, corridor area and I looked down and I saw this dog. <laughs> so this is a mama dog and these are her puppies. This is one of her puppies. And this is the one and only dog that we could not catch. Out of all the dogs that lived at the new safe confinement, we could not catch her. We got her puppies and she took off running and we can never find her again. And here we are, we're done and we're getting ready to go home and I see her. And then I find out that six weeks later, she did have a litter of puppies. So had we caught her, on um, that day, she would have been very, very early pregnant, and we would have been able to prevent those puppies from being born. So there are six more puppies that we have to go back very soon to spay and neuter, or they're going to start breeding with each other. All right, and this is, uh, this is our flag. that We hung it up in our clinic. We took it with us into the sarcophagus. We took it into the, um, the control room four. Um, and this flag I actually auctioned off on eBay. And even though this flag was, you know, I guess a four or six dollar flag, these radiation nerds um, actually paid over $200. They bid this flag up to over $200 uh, to win um, so that they could have a, a really great souvenir and to say that this flag has been inside of, of the control room and, and near the sarcophagus. It all goes to donations, so that was great. So we finally conclude our, our trip and we make it back to Kiev and we're in a restaurant having a, a good meal and some beers and we're waiting for the train to get on the train to go back to Poland. And once we were on the train to Poland, we see in the news that 400 meters from this restaurant, 12 hours after we left, 
it was bombed. Uh, so reality hit hard for me, really hard, realizing how every single day that these people are experiencing this nonstop and it's just horrible. And you can imagine, you know, we're eating dinner, we're having a good time. And 12 hours later, uh, this isn't the exact restaurant, but it's just 400 meters from this area. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a hard, hard reality of what's happening to these people every single day. So this is a, a video that Dima Korchek from the nuclear power plant made um, about our trip, our program. And I want to show it because it's a, it's a really amazing video. It's very well done. Um, I think everybody should watch it at least three or four times. Um, but it's going to probably rehash a lot of the things that I just said, but it's going to go into a little bit more detail and probably does a better job than, than I do. And so I'll go ahead and play this video and then we'll wrap things up and we will do a question and answer session. So we're here on site at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant and our goal this campaign is to focus on the dogs here in the local zone around the arch. They've been the most difficult dogs to catch by far. We've been here since 2017, 2018, 2019. Of course the COVID, the pandemic and the obvious situation now has made it difficult but we're finally back here and for the first time since 2017 we're having really good success catching the dogs here inside the local zone. They're clearly, the dogs here in this, in this zone here, are clearly the smartest, uh, most perceptive dogs that we've encountered since we've been here throughout Chernobyl town, Pripyat, and the surrounding area. Uh, they're very aware of people that are not, they're, they're visitors, right, versus the workers. So in, in the past, even in 2018, we dressed up as Novarka employees and that wasn't successful. We've, we've done all kinds of different things. The dogs are also, some of the dogs closer to the arch are a little bit aggressive. Um, and once one dog is caught in the past, all of the dogs get the signal and they're gone. And that the, the rest of the day is, is, is just done. So Dr. Betts, our, our veterinary medical director and I, we started looking at options and with the cooperation of the plant and the workers, we had a, a holding facility built up front and down here because there's two packs in the local zone. And then with the help of the workers that feed the dogs, we kind of uh, condition the dogs to go to this area, feed them regularly so they know the food is there. And now when we're here, we got them, right? Because we can shut the door and now we have these dogs. So we also have the help of, of Yuri Zabrodin and Roma and others that have been instrumental in preparing this. So we couldn't have just shown up on Monday and started doing this. It was the, the workers, the cooperation, and everyone together that's made this possible. And, and this has been one of the most successful, well, the most successful uh, work we've had inside this fence here. It's a very methodical process to make sure we provide humane care for the dogs, and of course we have radiation safety concerns. So we bring the dog through the clinic, excellent building we have right here on site. We weigh the dog for dosage and, and drug requirements. We frisk the dog for radiation. If the dog is clean, it passes through. If it's dirty, it stops there. We can do a quick decon with a wipe. We've taken uh, dogs outside for a bath, and we've even had to shave some dogs to clean the dogs. We've had a few dogs that have radiation internal, incorporated inside the, the bone structure. Clean. Chisto. Um, this is our medical record as the dog comes in. They, we, they get a number. They'll get a number on their leg. 
and we'll patient ID and the location that they're from and the date, whether they're male or female, what their weight. We're going to give them all vaccines. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, according to the weight, I'm going to get their medication and then we're going to give a little injection in the rear and it takes about five minutes for them to go to sleep and then we'll take them into prep to clean them up and then for surgery. Uh, once they're clean, they move forward to a prep station where they're prepared for surgery, they're shaved, and they're, they're uh, of course, they're sedated at, at that point as well. Then they go through the actual surgical process of a spay or a neuter. Then they move to the recovery area where they're monitored closely uh, for a, a nice and healthy recovery. We also mark the dog. So if people see a, a, a blue or a, a pink marking on the nose, that means they've been through our clinic and they've been spayed or neutered. That washes off after about five weeks. Then they go to recovery two, which means they're getting a little bit better and they're, they're kind of waking up. And before we release them, we make sure they're healthy and good to be released. And the best part of it is, if they come from this area, we can actually let them out the front door and they can, they can walk back and, and uh, live their lives. Hopefully we'll see a significant reduction in the population, uncontrolled breeding, uh, which, which creates all kinds of problems as we know. Uh, we wanted to get here earlier this year, but of course we're here now and we're doing everything we can with our partners. So I think the outcome will be uh, a better environment uh, and less population, especially going into the winter. As I've said before, we're, we've been here, we're here now, and we'll be here for the long term. And so we love the cooperation with Chernobyl Nuclear Power Plant. We have, we have friends, we have colleagues, and we're partners in this together. And we're ready to continue this type of cooperation and all the other types of cooperation we've developed over the years. Okay, <clears throat> and uh, one final thing I wanted to say, you know, speaking of reality, <clears throat> on June 28, excuse me, January 28, 2022, three, I was uh, woke up at three o'clock in the morning with a devastating phone call that Vadim had been killed on the Battle of Bakhmut. His entire unit was hit by a grad rocket and he, and six were killed and four were critically injured. So I wanna play this small tribute that that I made um, because we all miss him very dearly. Okay, sorry, I, I still get tore up when I when I see that Vadim was a very special person. Okay, so this is our uh, website here, cleanfutures.org. And like I said, you know, you could go to our, that we have a lot of uh, merchandise on there, souvenirs and memorabilia, things that you can, can purchase if you want. Uh, but, but, you know, we pretty much post a lot on, on Facebook and uh, someone on Instagram, so you can follow us on YouTube, and a lot of our videos are on uh, TikTok as well. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll go ahead and, and just go ahead and open this up and unmute everybody here so that we could do a, a question and answer session. Okay, 
So it should be uh, available to unmute yourself. And if you have any questions, just you know, speak up and, and uh, we'll see what we can do. Are you still finding it to be true that the dogs don't live very long because of the predators in the woods? You know, um, a lot of them in the further in the outskirts, the ones around the power plant actually do tend to live a little bit longer. Like the one you know, that was there was six years old. And some of those have been there. We know they've been there since 2017. In the outskirts of the area, unfortunately, there is a lot of wolf predation. They can get hit by cars um, in the area, um, a lot of other attacks from other animals. So that's why we don't see them living as long. Most of them, the most we've seen is probably five or six years of age. I had a question. How many, um, how many veterinarians do you have on, on your trips? I know yourself and is there so in the yeah. past, when we had large campaigns, we had four or five veterinarians at a time, and um, and you know even up to eight, I think at one point, because we would do it in, in sections, you know, two week sections. In this particular instance, I we couldn't bring a lot of people. You know, they didn't really didn't want us in there at all. Was, nobody was allowed, and still isn't allowed to get into the zone. Um, media can't get in there. Only only the IAEA and just a few people have been able to get in there. But since we've had a, a really good working relationship and they knew that we needed to get the dogs taken care of, you know, they allowed us to go. But they said, look, you, you can't bring tons of people here. And, and we wouldn't. We wouldn't ask people to come, general volunteers who we've never worked with before, to come into an area that's in the middle of a war to come into this area. So in this last instance, we uh, I was the uh, only veterinarian from the United States and, uh, and, and one other, Laurel was a veterinarian from the United States. And then we worked with three other veterinarians that were from Ukraine. So they were already in that area. And we'd worked with them in the past. Two of them I hadn't worked with in the past, but because they were Ukrainian, they were allowed to get in. That was the other issue is that we couldn't get anybody new in uh, that hadn't been, uh, been pre-approved and gone through the background check and everything to get in. So... Okay. Would your efficiencies go up quite a bit if you had more anesthetic machines or are you kind of at a limit with, <laughs> um, with your you size know, of personnel? You know, uh, in, with my machine, you know, I could do four animals at one time and I actually prefer to do only three at one time because when you, when you do that, then you've increased everything for two or three fold. So with the anesthesia machine, with three, three dogs at one time, you can have one person monitoring anesthesia. When you add that fourth one in there, it really becomes too much for one person. So if you had you know, more machines or more anesthesia, then all of a sudden you have a lot more people that you have to have, and it's a lot more that you have to take care of. And you know, we, we were pretty productive with, with a small group, lean and mean, and, and just get in there and, and do it. Um, so yeah, that... Uh, you know uh, who to call. Excuse me. You know who to call. I know. Thank you very much. He, 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 Brian made this incredible machine for me. I've had it for years, and but everybody calls me and wants to know where I got this from. It's uh, amazing. Uh, it packs up. I carry it on the airplane. Uh, they always stop me in security and ask me what in the world this thing is. But um, but it's great. Uh, so we'll go ahead, uh, Vili. I guess uh, we have your hand up. Hi. Thanks, Bally. Um, oh, yeah, no, that's okay. Um, I mean, congratulations on such an amazing job that you're you're doing out there. And um, yeah, I have a, a couple questions. I just, um, so I used to plan spay neuter clinics in uh, remote fly-in communities in Northern Canada here in, in one of the provinces where we have a lot of free roaming dogs and a lot of overpopulation issues. Um, and uh, one thing that we started, we're working on right now actually is um, a lay vaccinator program so that uh, folks in the community can vaccinate for parvo distemper rabies and then administer any deworming as well. Um, so I was wondering if that was something that, you know, you were potentially doing with the workers in Chernobyl. And my other question is, have you, we also started doing uh, super Lauren injections. Um, so chemical sterilization that lasts about, you know, a couple, 18 months to a couple years, just Logistically, it's you know very expensive to do spay neuter clinics in remote communities. We're spending you know ten to fifteen thousand dollars going up there. So in the interim, it was a really great way to do 
some sterilization um, until we could, you know, get back up to the community. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just curious about those two. Those well, two we've, you know, we've, we've had campaigns every year and we've pretty much been, been vaccinating them. There are a, a group of people who take care of, look after the dogs and, and whenever they're injured, they'll call me or they'll contact one of us and they tend to do some self-care. Um, they've also had some vaccines that they've been able to give. Uh, a lot of the flea medication, flea products, they will apply them monthly when they see them. And so uh, we really haven't had a need or thought about going in and doing any kind of um, you know, chemical sterilization or, or mm -hmm. delaying because we have been able, our goal has been to get in there and to basically uh, stop the over overbreeding. You know, we don't we want to make them as comfortable. We can, they cannot be removed from the area at all. And mm -hmm. so we want to make them as comfortable as possible as long as they live uh, in that area. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, there's another hand up. Go ahead. Hello. Um, is that me? Yes, Other yeah, people have hands up. And so I, I didn't know if that was about me. Um, so, um, so like I've uh, just a bit of background, like I've uh, lived in Slavutic for like four months in uh, 2021. Um, I study like post-traumatic growth um, after uh, the event that we call Chernobyl. And so um, against that background, I'm wondering how, like what material or existential changes you all witnessed, um, I guess, begin like since the beginning of the full-scale invasion, but especially like between your visits in June and October, and I guess that could mean like the repair of bridges or social life in Slavutic or um, or Chernobyl town um, or like the behavior of the dogs. I'm just curious. Um, so in, in Slavutic, um, uh, about, I would say around four or 4,000 people have left. Uh, you know, the town's a very small town or about 20,000 uh, people that live there. And I think they're down to around 16,000. Uh, in Chernobyl town, everybody's gone. There are some self-settlers, some babushkas that live out in the areas that have stayed, but uh, you, you can't even get into the area. So um, it, it's, it's non-existent. So a lot of the dogs you know, ran off, wandered off. We don't know where they went. Um, some of them in search of food, whatever, but um, it's, it's, it's definitely is a, a wasteland now because it is, it's dead there. And the train that you would take from, so the workers take the train from Slavutic, 45 minute train line, ride that goes through Belarus and then into Chernobyl. That train is non-functional, the bridge, it's blown up. And there's, no, even if it was functional, we, we would not wanna be going through Belarus um, to go to Chernobyl. So it's a huge drastic change. And unfortunately, I don't see this uh, recovering or changing from this for a very long time. I'm so sorry, just a brief follow up. I'm curious. Um, so how do you all or like how do plant workers get from Slavutic to um, like, do they have to go back to down to Kiev and then to Ivankiv and enter the Dipyatki? So they are bussed, two big, huge buses. They are on two week shifts. And so they have to leave their family, which is a real problem because, you know, some people have kids, they have dogs, they have other issues. Um, so they get on the bus and they take the eight hour ride because they have to go back through Kiev and it's on a bus and you can't go very fast and the roads are just terrible. They're just potholes and everything. And they sleep in the power plant for two weeks. Um, we have provided sleeping bags for them, cots. We installed um, hot water heaters so that they could take showers. Um, and basically this is, this is what they're dealing with right now. Um, there were a lot of layoffs. A lot of people were laid off um, since, this, since this happened. Also basically to scale down because they don't know when another invasion is going to happen and if they're going to try to take over the power plant again. So they don't want to put anybody else at risk. So, you know, people <laughs> laid off. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all of the work that you do. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Teresa, you have your hand up, maybe? Oops, got to unmute. Yeah. yeah, I was just curious. I kind of emailed with you back and forth a few times. I've been following what you guys do. Um, and, you know, I think it's amazing. But I was wondering, you know, I'm a small animal vet here down in Tennessee in the United States. And I was just wondering if there's any opportunity in the future um, to be a part, to be more of a part of this or how that actually works. You know, at, at this point, we're pretty much 
in the maintenance phase. So we've, we've spayed and neutered a large significant amount of them. At one point we, we had about 90% of the population, but because of COVID, you know, that kind of grew back. And we were back down to just the maintenance phase where we just had our key people that, that came in so we could just go in as a lean, lean mean team. Um, you know, and we, we did have plans that, you know, in the future, if we ever did bring more people on again, that we, you know, we would advertise. But unfortunately now, um, because nobody can get into the zone, they're only allowing us and people that have been there before who have already previously been through the, the background check and so that they know that they're not, you know, Russian spies or whatever that are trying to enter in. And, you know, I have no idea how long that's gonna, gonna last. Um, the population of dogs has drastically decreased, one, because of the spay and neuter that we've done, but also during the invasion, you know, nobody was there for 30 days to feed them. And, and this is, and luckily at the power plant, they stayed there and they did work getting some scraps, but some of the dogs in Chernobyl town and Pripyat, all those areas, they've, they've disappeared and we don't know where they are. So I don't imagine that we're gonna be having a large spay neuter campaign from here on out. Um, most of it's gonna be just maintaining them, making sure that they're cared for medically, making sure that they're vaccinated, flea products, any injury to take care of, et cetera. Do you have much incidence of heartworm there or do you, have you even kind of looked into that? We actually, uh, in this last uh, situation, we actually heartworm and 4DX tested every single one of the dogs that we had. And we had one heartworm positive and two Ehrlichias and that was it. Oh, well, that's actually really good. Yeah. Oh, cool. um, they do Thank have you. heartworm in, in Kiev. They do have heartworm, you know, it is an issue. It does get warm enough, but um, uh, it hasn't really, we didn't see anything in, in this population of dogs. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ruth? Hey, Dr. Betts. Um, I work at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine, so I was really happy to see the USC logo on your van. Yeah. yeah. And but I didn't know I didn't even know we had a Chernobyl Research Institute, so I was poking around on our website, you know, during your talk. And um, are you still collaborating with Dr. Musso? Yes, very much so. Yeah. Um, we also uh, he and I also have a, a nonprofit called Visiting Veterinarians International, where we go and do spay neuters in other areas, other countries. Uh, we also are doing uh, 40X testing research on all of the dogs that we uh, do spay and neuter on as part of his, uh, a, a sideline research that he's doing as well. Okay, good deal. Yeah. I'll have to pop yeah. in else. You'll have to stop in and say hi to him. He's in yeah. South Korea right now. At, um, oh, okay. Dealing with Fukushima, but um, uh, okay. Lori, Lori, you have a question? Mine's more of a statement. Oh, <laughs> I, <laughs> you know me. Um, I just want to say sorry about Vadim. Um, but on a lighter note, tell um, Brian, Brian, I love you for making that anesthesia machine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want one. One day. One day. <laughs> when, Christina, when Christina and I grow up and have a big enough doctors to do spay neuter for more than one doctor right yeah um christina works with me but i i i know that i work with dr betts um and visiting veterinarians but this just gave me a completely different respect for you oh thank you <laughs> okay i'm gonna mute myself now okay <laughs> Um, I don't, I, for some reason, I can only see like six people. I don't know if anybody else has their hand up. If, if you have yeah. questions, don't worry about putting your hand up. Just go ahead and unmute yourself and scream out because, uh, I can't see anybody. Um, see Chris walking around, but, uh, hi, um, my name is Jenna. I am a veterinarian and a public health veterinarian. I had a mm -hmm. question. Your focus is mostly on the, the dogs. I understand that there's also fairly large stray cat population there. Is there anyone taking care of that situation? Or are you guys working on that as well? well? Yeah, we also spay and neuter the cats. Um, obviously there aren't any cats at the, um, at the uh, local zone. <clears throat> the dogs wouldn't al allow it, but in Chernobyl town and Pripyat and in, in all of the areas, especially the babushkas that are self settlers that live out further out, they have a whole bunch of cats. 
And so, yes, we would also collect the cats and, and do them. There aren't near as many cats as there are dogs. At one point we had over, you know, it was believed to be over 700. And obviously we've done 750 dogs over the years, but it, at one time we had over 700 dogs that were there and there were several hundred cats. And, and I believe over the, the five years, the three first three years that we were there, uh, we did around 200 cats, I believe, out of that. Well, thank you. And thank you for all the work that you're doing there. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, Jennifer. Yes. Um, it's, Car it's Caroline here from New Zealand. Um, ah. thank, thank you for a brilliant talk. Um, just um, two questions. Um, is there anywhere you can like share the doses of um, the oral sedatives? Because I think I saw you a while ago asking for doses um, of what you gave um, in the food and how you did it. And also, is there a way, um, the amazing anesthetic machine, <laughs> um, do you have like a patent on that? Or like, is there a way you can share knowledge of how to do four with four dogs on one machine and can you individually um change the gas dose on each dog if you've got four from one or is it just a flat rate uh, you can't um so be, be maintain it they're all four on there and they're all on the same dose um so if we have one that's uh, really light and the other ones are are you know fine then usually what we can do is we can unhook them and then turn up the gas to get them to, to go down. So it's, and that's why I say when you have three of them at one time, one person can manage it. When you get four, it's too much for one person because it is a balancing act to get used to that machine. And, and Lori, uh, Lori has ma managed this machine many, many times on campaigns that I've been on it. It is a balancing act and it does take, I can't just take somebody off the street and say, here, you know, do this machine because it, it is um, something that, that uh, you know, takes a lot of, of, of struggle to, to do that, but it works great. Um, Brian Lawson, who's on here, is um, the owner and creator, founder of Supira Anesthesia Medical Systems. And so he, um, I could probably give you his, his information uh, if you're interested. And as far as the dosage, yes, I, <clears throat> before we went, because I was going to be using the oral sedatives, I reached out to all of the Facebook veterinary groups that I could to find trying to get oral dosages for things that would work. And um, I, I did find some. Mostly it was gabapentin, trazodone, acepromazine, um, and yeah, maybe that was it. And and then I put a bunch in there, and then I put a bunch more because it wasn't yeah. working. And then it finally worked. So um, that I could I could tell you, you know, I send you an email or whatever. You can just email me, and I'll and I'll let you know what we used. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you. I'm really sorry to hear about Vadim. He seemed like an incredible person. Thank you. Thank you. Caroline, I'm happy to fly out and teach you how to use that machine. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I don't. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in and I'll jump in with kind of a global offer. If anyone is interested, we do a lot of these either donate machines or drastically reduce price for uh, these types of non rebreathing anesthesia machines that work great at going to remote places. Just get in touch with us. Jennifer has my contact information and uh, we're more than happy to help in any way. Thanks, Thank Brian. Thank you very much, everyone. Cool. Uh, see anybody else? I see two little hands up, but I can't, for some reason I can only see like eight people. If there's anybody else, go ahead. Sophie, hey Sophie, how are Hi. you? Hi, it's good to see you. Good. Um, when you were talking about the puppies that had the radiation in their skull and my jaw was on the floor, I was like, how is that even pot? I'm just so curious how that, how that happened. Cause I remember when I was there, like there was like maybe one dog that needed a bath and that was it. Um, so, you know, the area that where Eric showed his finger and did the radiation, that's where these puppies were living. And so it just so happened that a part particles of the reactor when it exploded was settled in this area. And these dogs actually happened to make their nest there. And so when you have young puppies that are rapidly growing and they're laying down new bone, the, uh, the cesium-137 gets absorbed into the bone and just sucks it up uh, and, 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 and acts like calcium to the bone. And so that's what happened with, with these dogs. And we actually found several of them like that. Um, you know, most of it's external and you can wash it off and, and they're fine. 
Um, but we don't know, you know, what's going to happen with these dogs. And obviously we're watching them very closely. Do you expect them to have issues down the road because of this? It's possible. Yeah, it's possible if they live long enough. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I absolutely loved hearing you talk. You did an amazing job. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, I, I do just have one more question kind of going off of um, what Sophie asked. Um, how, like, it, just in terms of percentage, um, how many dogs um, have uh, this internal contamination from strontium-90? Um, you know, I think over the years, the only ones that we found that were internal, we could not wash them off, were the ones that we found this time. And there was a, a, a couple of them, there's about four or five of them that we found, and they were puppies. So uh, all the rest of them, we are able to decontaminate to wash, wash the contamination off of them. And um, they did find them, we weren't, able, weren't able to. Find. Now, the thing that Dr. Mousseau is researching is is he's checking their DNA for mutations to see, because a lot of this you're not gonna see later until later in life. Um, you know, um, a lot of them live, live long enough to have tumors and things. And so they're already identifying genetic mutations due to radiation in the DNA that they have been, that we've been sampling. So we've been sampling since 2017 and we have over, you know, over five, 600 samples now of dogs. Um, some of them are the same samples uh, that taken again from the same animals. Um, and we can also, they've also been able to isolate. Yes, these are, these, this is this dog's mother and this is this dog's puppy and this is this dog's father and been able to put a whole tree together for those. Oh, so is that how the lineage was established? Like since Pripyat? Yep. Fascinating. And so I just want to make sure I don't, I'm not misunderstanding. Um, so uh, since the full scale invasion, you have found like an unusual number of dogs with this, with the internal contaminants? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say unusual. And keep in mind that we were never successful uh, at the power, at the uh, local zone of catching dogs there. So each time we went, we would only get four or five dogs every year from this area. Uh, and that was because of our, our limited restrictions and because they would, they're just, it's hard in that area. And so I wouldn't expect to see, because all around Chernobyl, not every place is hot. And so right at the power plant is where you're going to find the hottest zones. And that's where these dogs were living. You know, Chernobyl town, there's hardly not a lot of radiation in that area. And Pripyat, not a lot of radiation in that area. So all of the dogs that we've collected, the majority of them for around, around the power plant and the surrounding areas, not from the local zone. And so I really wouldn't say that it was a large amount. It was just a, an amount that we, that we found that we hadn't seen in the past because we weren't catching dogs from that area. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Sure. And this was a truly beautiful talk. Oh, thank and you. And I'm sure that everyone feels that way. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay. Going once, going twice. All right. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and wrap it up unless anybody has any last questions. Um, I really appreciate uh, you being here, uh, like I said, today is the 37th anniversary of the explosion that happened, and it was a pretty devastating dating thing. Um, uh, going to Chernobyl was an opportunity for me, and it was something that, that drastically <coughs> changed my life and changed my direction um, of, of what I do, um, and has opened up a lot of doors and met a lot of amazing people during this. And um, um, we are going back. We can't say when. Uh, obviously for, for safety reasons, but uh, we will keep you guys updated on, on Facebook and Instagram and et cetera. Um, it might be a little delayed. Like last time, everything that we posted was actually delayed one week um, so that we wouldn't be able to be located. Um, when we go there, we have to shut off our phones. We, uh, so we don't have any GPS tracking or anything like that. Cause um, you know, it is, it is not a safe place to be, unfortunately. Hopefully things will change very soon uh, with this devastating war. Um, but uh, right now we just do what we can. So, all right. I uh, appreciate everyone being here. And hey, Jen, your camera's going in and out, but I see you waving there. Hello. Hi, Jen. <laughs> all right. I'm going to go ahead and we'll end here. Thank you, everybody.
If anybody has any questions, you can email us. Our, our email is on our website um, and, and then we'll be able to answer it. Thank you.